All right, let's be honest with ourselves. Before you sat down to watch Survivor Series 2021, who among us actually thought, well, I'm sure by the end of the show, my two biggest takeaways would be, man, I really want some pizza. And what happened to Vince McMahon's giant gold egg? Also, man, do I want to go and watch the brand new rock film known as Red Notice? And the best thing about this entire pay-per-view is the whole time it was just, oh my gosh, The Rock. Oh, The Rock, we love The Rock. So I was like, oh great, The Rock's going to show up. <laughs> And then he did it. To never forget that Dwayne Johnson did turn up on Impact via a video to induct Ken Shamrock to the Hall of Fame. But he wasn't on Survivor Series. I love wrestling. You have also probably noticed that I am wearing this t-shirt that says give me an up with some arrows. And also, and I have this very self-indulgent one as well. And if you go to shop.whatculture.com, you shall find that you now can buy these t-shirts and they should be good to go the first week of December. And then maybe one day, we can tune into a wrestling show and everyone will be wearing them. And finally, my parents will be proud. But yes, hello, my name is Simon Miller. The Survivor Series is in the books. So let's give the good bits an up <laughs> and the bad bits a down. And we do indeed start with a down. Shucks. Because it was on the pre-show where Damian Priest was taken on Shinsuke Nakamura. And because WWE hates us all, it ended in disqualification. Why? Because the whole reason of this pay-per-view is that it's brand versus brand, meaning the sell job is, well, I wonder who's going to win. I mean, now we have the US champion versus the Intercontinental champion. Finally, we're going to know who the better wrestler is. But we don't, because it ended in a flub finish. And both guys were great, but they got screwed by the booking. I mean, at one point, Rick Boogs was just going, rah, 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 rah. I'm playing his guitar. So Damien Priest lost his mind. He broke the guitar. He hit every single person he possibly could with the remains. And yes, it was disqualification time. So bring down the board. That rolls up to 64. And this is just something they could have done on Raw. I ain't gonna lie to you, I could not believe it. Survivor Series then started properly and all day long social media been going, oh my gosh, Becky Lynch versus Charlotte Flair is gonna be the main event. And then it was on first. <laughs> Amazing. And I was convinced that this was gonna have a stupid finish as well. So I watched the whole thing like a horror movie, like through my hand, cause I was so terrified. And while it wasn't shenanigan free, the match itself I thought was really good. And we kinda sort of got a definitive winner. So I was absolutely fine with that. Becky was super fired up even before the bell rang, which was a bit like, well, it used to be a shoot, now it's work, now it's work shoot, to the point you just stand there and scratch your head like, what the hell is going on? And is Vince Russo around here? And just to make you think that this was super duper real, they were laying in their punches and they were laying in their kicks. I mean, seriously, it looked kind of painful. Lynch was just getting cheered like crazy too, so surely now it's finally time just to ignore this heel turn and go with what the fans want. And Charlotte in particular didn't like this, so she grabbed Lynch's head and she smashed it into the ring canvas. Then she took it and she smashed it into the ring post. So I think what we have learned on this November night is that Charlotte Flair does not like Becky Lynch's face. They were then pushing each other into the barricade and my word, this poor barricade, it gets it every single night. And given that that ended in a stalemate, when they got back in the ring, Charlotte and Becky were just slapping each other. Ow, that hurt. And honestly, some of these slaps, they were laying them in. It was then pure wrestling tennis as Becky Lynch went for the arm bar, but Charlotte Flair powerbombed her. And then Charlotte Flair went for a moonsault, but Becky Lynch got out of the way of that. And then she kind of kneed her in the back of the head. This was pretty stiff. They were then just wiggling out of whatever the other person had when they were then trying their own stuff, meaning there was then more wiggling. And by the time Becky Lynch locked on the figure four, this crowd was going nuts. Once again, just make her a good guy. This annoyed Charlotte once again, so she went to try and use Becky Lynch's disarmor. But then when none of this worked, these are two experienced wrestlers, so they started busting out the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment, the surprise roll-up. However, Charlotte grabbed the ropes and the referee saw it, saying, you're not allowed to do that. So Becky Lynch then hit the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment, and she grabbed the ropes. And because wrestling officials are dummies, they didn't see Becky Lynch won. So yeah, that is some straight up nonsense right there, but at least we saw somebody get their hand raised. Right now in WWE, I will take it to the point it is getting it up. Where's that on my t-shirt? I think it's this one, it's this one, haha, <laughs> right here. We then started to be reminded that yes, it was 25 years ago when The Rock debuted in the WWE, and honestly, do not even care about this 
unless you're really into eggs. It was also then time for the Men's Survivor Series match, and I genuinely thought that as they made their entrances, Adam Pearce was just gonna walk out and go, nope, you're out, we're bringing this person in, and sorry to you, you ain't in it anymore. That did not happen, so we did have Drew McIntyre, Happy Corbin, Sheamus, Jeff Hardy, and Xavier Woods taking on Finn Balor, Seth Rollins, Kevin Owens, Austin Theory, and Bobby Lashley, and look, that is a ton of good talent. They just had an okay, but pretty good, actually I enjoyed it elimination match. Up. Now he did kind of suck at first because straight away we asked the question, well, how couldn't they coexist? Because Kevin Owens decided, nah, bruh, I don't want to hang around here. So he just walked out and he got counted out. Now, while on the one hand, that is dumb, it actually does make sense. Like, if Kevin Owens doesn't like Finn Balor, and Kevin Owens doesn't like Seth Rollins, and Kevin Owens doesn't like any of his other teammates, why the hell would he waste any time waiting around? So the fact that he did just leave, well, yes, I can buy into it. Otherwise, this was quite well balanced with Austin Theory getting a lot of time in order to try and build him into a superstar. And the second guy to go was Happy Corbin after Finn Balor had given him the coup de gras. We then had Finn Balor versus Jeff Hardy for a little bit, and everyone was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. Almost like maybe, just maybe, we should be doing new feuds. King Woods was the next guy to run wild, so of course, eventually, he ran straight into Bobby Lashley's hurt lock, so he was out of there as well. And because Bob is a mega asshole, well, he wouldn't release the hole. This triggered the tag klaxon as Team Smackdown ran in there, and Drew McIntyre, he was so riled up by the fact Bobby Lashley had done this, him and Bob started to brawl, they fought to the outside, and then they both got counted out. Are you kidding me? So this was once again just classic WWE going, well, wait a minute, Drew McIntyre's a big deal on SmackDown, and Bobby Lashley, he's a big deal on Raw. We don't really want them pinned, and we don't really want submitted to, even though we're doing brand versus brand, or who is better, we will just have them not be able to hear a referee going, one of the people fighting seven, eight, nine, ten. So not only does it tie into the bad WWE tropes, but it just made both of them look really stupid. Fans booed all of that as well, so Drew gave Bobby Lashley the Claymore kick to try and save this. And then Seth Rollins was just prodding Drew McIntyre behind because he's such a piece of crap. So McIntyre turned around and he bopped him right in the head. Somehow this all led to Sheamus giving the bro kick to Finn Balor and he was gone. And that was a little bit sad. And then we did have a tag team match as it was Sheamus and Jeff Hardy taking on Seth Rollins and Austin Theory. Although that makes sense because those two used to be in a group. Seth sure Jeff Hardy wasn't able to tag in and this caused Sheamus so much confusion. He got hit by the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment. And yes, that's too courtesy of Austin Theory. So he was gone. And then we kind of did have a little wink, wink, nudge, nudge to other things that have happened this year because Jeff Hardy hit the Swanton Bomb onto Austin and he got rid of him. And don't forget, only a few weeks ago, he was taking the pictures. It also meant we were down to Seth Rollins versus Jeff Hardy, and the crowd just loved Jeff Hardy so much. WWE really needs to start listening to this. And there was no way in one million years that Jeff was going to win this. So eventually, Seth Rollins, he hit the curb stomp. One, two, three, he is the sole survivor. This was really fun to the point you'll be a little confused because you'll be like, how can the build be so bad, but the match be so good? Although I will say, if you go back and watch Survivor Series 2020, well, it kind of feels like WWE used many of the same ideas. We then had more rock nonsense, which was followed by Vince McMahon arriving in a limousine where a bunch of the roster was just going, oh, Vince McMahon, we love you, we love you, as they all chanted for a golden egg. This also then led into a segment when Roman Reigns went to Vince McMahon's office and Vince was all like, oh, hey, pal, have you seen this $100 million egg The Rock gave me? And Roman should have gone, no, I can't even believe those words came out of your mouth. What the hell is happening? So obviously this is just one big tie into Netflix's Red Notice, which is The Rock's brand new movie. But WWE couldn't handle just having one bit of marketing on the show. So we then went to the Battle Royal, whatever the hell that was, which basically was just sponsored by Pizza Hut. And look, I really don't care. Businesses are doing this all the time, but why does it have to be so in your face? Like I half expected a pizza to come out of my TV and just start going in my mouth. And I'd be like, no, I don't want it. It's not cheat day. This was also in celebration of the fact that it was The Rock's 25th anniversary. And I don't need to laugh, but it's just so strange. It's just so surreal. I sat there and I was like, who is this for? And the only answer I could come up with was Vincent Kennedy McMahon. And I suppose it was mostly fine because it was every single WWE Battle Raw you'd ever seen. Although this time the focal point was on Pizza Hut, 
but also Omos. Because essentially, just to give you the too long didn't read, he chucked everybody out, he won the thing, which I think now makes him the brand new rock. So I'll start calling him the Omos, even though that doesn't really make any sense. We also teased that maybe, just maybe, this was gonna be the start of the breakup between Omos and AJ Styles, because he essentially accidentally dropped him while General Aziz was also pulling on the other side. But straight after this, AJ Styles was like, oh no, I don't care because I want some pizza. And then the Street Profits stole the pizza and then they threw the pizza into the crowd. I promise you, I'm not making any of this up. And while I personally do really like Omos, you could have taken this off the pay-per-view and it wouldn't have made a blind bit of difference. Down. Okay, bro versus the Usos was next though. It was good. Up. I got it utterly wrong because I presumed that RK bro was going to lose here, which would tie into the eventual breakup of those two, but they did not. And now I'm really worried about Jimmy and Jay because we're going to get to Friday and Roman's going to find them. He's going to rip their head off their body and then, I don't know, probably get some pizza and put it inside. The real joy of this, though, was that not only were the Usos acting as a tag team or working as a tag team because they are a tag team, but Randy Orton and Matt Riddle are now also working together as a tag team. So there was just a bunch of double team moves. It didn't feel like anything else on the show. And also, now officially, Randy Orton has been on more matches on pay-per-view than anybody in the history of WWE. What a legend he has become. This whole thing was basically Riddle getting beaten up before he did get the hot tag to Randy Orton as well, who was so rolled up that he grabbed Jimmy and Jay and he threw them into the announce table. And after Riddle had tagged back in, Jimmy didn't notice that Randy had done a secret blind tag. So when he dived off the ropes, Randy Orton gave him the diving RKO. It looked flubbing great, and it got the uno, dos, tres. That was it. We kind of just moved on because as ever, there was never really any stakes here. But man, it was fine for what it was. Vince McMahon's golden egg then went missing. I mean, it had only been introduced an hour beforehand, so why the hell I was supposed to care about it, I don't know. But where the hell is the golden egg? So I'm going and Adam Pearce were also summoned to try and find this egg. And you'll have to forgive me because I'm not 100% sure, but I think they said they shall do this later on on Raw and that the SmackDown roster will be there as well. So I swear, if The Rock doesn't turn up on Raw later, I do not know what is going on anymore. The only other choice is that it turns out to be Repo Man, but you can't do that because while I will be celebrating and doing backflips around my living room, everybody else is going to be super duper pissed off. I swear. Did I make this up? Did I fall asleep and I dreamed all this? And if I did, what the hell is wrong with me? The Women's Survivor Series match was next, meaning it was Rhea Ripley, Bianca Belair, Zelina Vega, Carmella and Liv Morgan taking on Tony Storm, Sasha Banks, Shotzi, Shayna Baszler and Natalia. And look, it wasn't as good as the men's. There was some kind of miscommunication here and there. A lot of people got dropped on their heads. But when all was said and done, Bianca Belair was the sole survivor. And for that alone, up. However, this went so far into the whole, oh, how can they coexist storyline that at some points it was actually quite hard to watch. I mean, the whole point of the night was that SmackDown lost everything because nobody else would be able to get on. And here it all came down to Sasha Banks and Shotzi. But also, what does it even mean? How can they coexist? What do you mean, how can they coexist? Like one of them all of a sudden goes poof and vanishes into the abyss? No, they're still existing. It really is so, so dumbed down. The big centerpiece at first too was all situated around Carmella's mask as well. So that was also kind of strange. And I realized during this night, wait a minute, we have somebody on the roster called Vega and they don't wear a mask. I don't want to talk about it. Tony Storm used all of this fracas to hit the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment to get rid of Carmella. And while that was good for Tony Storm, it was way too many surprise roll-ups. And then all of a sudden, Shotzi and Sasha Banks weren't able to get on because how are they going to coexist? Look what it does to my body. I just lose all power of my limbs. Tony also then got rid of Zelina. And because everybody was loving this, Liv Morgan then hit the oblivion to get rid of Tony Storm. It's like WWE gives you a present. And when you open it up to see a brand new Xbox, they take it and they run away. Sasha Banks was then eliminating Liv Morgan as it really did become you go, I go, you go, I go. And then Shayna Baszler and Shotzi worked together to get rid of Rhea Ripley. And this is when, once again, people just kept landing on their heads. This did really work, though, because all of a sudden it was Shotzi, Sasha Banks, Shayna Baszler and Natalia taking on Bianca Belair so you could put your binoculars on and figure out what was going to happen. I mean, she should have just run through all of them. But of course, WWE was like, no, we can't have Sasha Banks lose. So her OT made 
sure she got counted out and that annoyed me so much. Look, I ripped out my own hair. But after this, we went into full taboo mode and that was fine with me. Because Belair took out Shayna Baszler and Natalia really quickly. And yes, there was another most devastating move in all of sports entertainment in there. So we were going way too much. And when it came down to Bianca versus Shotzi, she hit the KID. She got the one, two, three. So if you can believe it, she looked damn dominant and we should just make her the damn champion and start making sure she becomes an even bigger star. So yes, this one was a little bit hit and miss, but again, overall, the destination is where we want it to be. WWE then just went shrug emoji when it came to a storyline, because as Kayla Braxton and Paul Hamer were doing an interview, Kayla just went, oh, Paul, by the way, Brock Lesnar's suspension isn't indefinite anymore. So that's the reason. If anybody asks, you just go, shut up. Before this, they were also talking about Vince McMahon's stolen egg. So now I have decided Brock Lesnar took it. That's right. And it now lives up with him on his farm. Nobody will ever see it again. This all did lead into our main event too, where it was Roman Reigns taking on Big E. And we really did need something else here to make it, oh my gosh. But it was a very, very good match. Up. We sold Big E's strength to begin with as well, which was really cool because Roman Reigns isn't a small guy. And then seconds after this, Big E leapfrogged Roman Reigns. And I couldn't help but sit there and just think, wow, what a terrific fella. Big E then went for a splash, but it seemed like he tweaked his knee. And make sure you remember that like a telltale game. And Roman Reigns saw this from a mile off. So he started to work him over all by going, ha ha ha, I'm the tribal chief. I mean, he really is an unhinged human being. And this is when we got down into the wrestling tennis. Because Reigns slammed Big E with a choke slam. So Big E came back with a urinage. And when he was going for a stretch muffler, Reigns powerbombed his ass. Honestly, this sequence of moves looked really, really good. Roman was then back to doing rock bombs. And I'm sure some people are going, the rock's going to come out of the end. But of course he did not. So who the hell knows what was going on? But he then started to land Superman punch after Superman punch. But none of this affected Big E. And Big E kicked out of the spear. Now, while that was a good moment at the time, sadly, it really did telegraph the finish. This was even more obvious after Big E had hit the big ending and Roman Reigns got his hand on the rope. And really, all of this tied into that knee injury from earlier because they got back into the ring. Big E was about to hit the big ending. His leg went away. Roman Reigns gave him the chop block, gave him this badass looking spear. And yes, Roman wins again. And I know what you're thinking. What is the end game here? Somebody better ask that off. It was really well put together. And as soon as we were done, out came The Rock. He was like, ha ha, I stole the golden egg. And of course that didn't happen. There was nothing to do with The Rock and there was nothing else to do with the golden egg. And this was one of the most surreal pay-per-views I have seen in a while. I mean, why the hell would you focus the whole show around him if he's not going to turn up? Even if he does arrive at Raw, it still doesn't make any sense. And because of all those teases, which you do need to pay off, it really does have to get it down. But look, seriously, despite the rubbish build, I still thought Survivor Series in and of itself was a good pay-per-view. So I shall give it an up. But honestly, if we get to next year and we're still doing this brand versus brand thing, well, somebody needs to take a long, hard look at themselves in the mirror. Now, please do leave a comment below and let us know what you thought about last night's episode of Survivor Series. That doesn't make sense. Just let us know what you think about Survivor Series. It wasn't an episode. Like the video, share the video, and subscribe. Head on over to whatculture.com where you can keep up to date with all the latest wrestling news. Make sure you follow us on social media. Make sure you watch more videos and shop.whatculture.com to get your very own ups and downs t-shirt. My name is Simon Miller. Thank you for joining me as always. There has been a lot of wrestling this last week, so I shall now rest before we get to Raw, where we ask the big question, will we see The Rock? I'm going to say no. <laughs>